can we afford to sleep on this oral clues in osa this is our next topic may i call upon dr amruta baveskar and dr pooja thakur to chair the next session dr amruta is uh, the pa the member of the task force team pediatrics and uh, the co-founder director of shashwat multi specialty clinic Uh, Dr. Pooja Thakur is consultant pediatrician and neonatologist. She is also the co-founder and director of uh, Spectrum Multi Specialty Clinic. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a good quality sleep is often a neglected aspect, and it is very, very important to maintain a good quality life. Who better than Dr. Shridhar Ganpati to enlighten us about the importance of sleep and sleep studies? I request and welcome Dr. Shridhar Ganpati, sir, on stage. Dr. Shridhar Ganpati is a pediatrician at Sanjeevni Nursing Home and Top Hill, Mumbai. He's done his fellowship pediatric sleep medicine at Sydney Children's Hospital, Australia. May I request her to begin his speech? Yeah. yeah thank. Thank you so much. And uh, this is one place where I. really enjoy to talk i mean i really enjoy this sort of an audience and i've learned a lot from the topic on humility is one thing and uh, it just comes out from them and uh, the way the session was conducted so as it was amazing thank you ramesh thank you bavish thank you for the invitation and i thought uh, this is one group which is very passionate about what they do and the cohesive synergy that you all have I'd, i haven't seen it in any other group and that's exactly what my wife was saying uh, I, i think after the last two sessions or three sessions it's going to be very difficult to maintain the tempo because the first one was very simple my guru he made it so simple no pictorial representation but still everything got into our brains because he connected with us and i'm going to try to do the same thing with you all uh, and i hope it's not like a lullaby and i put you off to sleep because suhas has told me your time is restricted and i have a lot of photographs because i basically feel photos create a better impact than written stuff and i think right from the morning uh, even though i think mukesh the talk was had so much in it but when you go down to transcriptomics and receptors and inhibitors it it really gives you a little you get jacked up no he was talking about all jack inhibitors and i got jacked up and started off with great fundas with uh, dr kupchandani but i think nothing is created except awareness so what we are trying to do here i think in tapicon is we are just trying to create awareness that there is so much of advancement in medicine and we need to keep our eyes open as far as that is concerned and like my guru always says every platform is basically to unlearn before you learn fine so that's something very important don't come with a bag of expectations and preconceived notions then it becomes very difficult to uh, pick up things that we are trying to teach you so what i'm going to try to convey in the next 20 minutes is why mouth breathing is important why the tongue plays a very important role in breathing and why certain habits will predispose you if you are genetically predisposed to get an osa and osa is again considered to be like a western disease it's come up with evolution and probably it's a mismatch between the way you have grown and the exposure so that's what we have been talking since morning that you cannot take one thing separately it's an interaction between the human genome the exposome and what you carry so i i used to talk a lot on the microbiota that also i'll be discussing in sleep Okay does this happen to you when you are listening to a lecture be very frank raise your hands usually oh that's wonderful so usually what we do is we click a photograph before we start our session and the number of people with open mouths can you see this it's almost 30% and i'm going to show you why that is a bad habit and bad habits stick and they cause a lot of problems in your orofacial musculature that you require to tune them up also so if this happens it means we are sleep deprived and does this also happen that it is so bad that even though it is interesting you struggle to keep your eyes open 
This is scary because this is micro sleeps. Okay, so you're getting micro sleep. They only last a few seconds. And if you're busy driving in the middle of the night, that little lapse of concentration is enough to create an accident. So if you do have this, I think you, it's time for you to improve on your sleep hygiene. The biggest problem today with sleep is you can buy a bed, you can buy a pillow, but you can't buy sleep. And what inhibits sleep and what inhibits your melatonin drive is the blue light. And we have plenty of blue light emanating from all our electronic devices. And we need to shift to a night reader or something of that sort and even have smart lighting which we get nowadays so that the pollution by blue light is suppressed and get into the habit of a proper sleep hygiene because it's a part of the biological rhythm. And like my guru was saying in the morning, everything is connected. So you try to fiddle with one thing, you may be causing a problem elsewhere. Fine, so this was what was happening with me when I was making my slides in the night. I was extremely sleepy because the main purpose of me presenting this topic today is also what I learned from my dad. He's got Parkinson's, he's got a lot of oropharyngeal issues. And what we did realize is one thing that we all neglect is exercise. We talk about medications, we talk about all forms of therapy, but we don't teach yoga, we don't teach a good physiotherapy that goes a very long way in rehabilitation. So the usual thing that we do is have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee. And do you think that is good? No, it's not good. Because you need to understand that adenosine buildup is the thing that causes sleep. And all that you do with a caffeinated product is you block this adenosine receptor. You're only blocking the receptor. You're not stopping the buildup of adenosine. So caffeine has its own bag of side effects. And the moment you come out of the side effects of caffeine, you have adenosine buildup, which again comes in with a big... Uh, it, so it's going to be extremely detrimental to get into this sort of a habit. So the question is, does sleep matter? So my first slide was, are we sleeping over our problems? Do you think it's better to sleep over your problems? Yes, you need to sleep. So today problem solving is better if you sleep. So if I'm giving an exam, I used to be proud enough to tell my, uh, my, my colleagues that I slept hardly for two hours. It affects memory, it affects concentration, it affects performance. And you need to understand this. And I'll give you a very simple example. The day you have not slept, the next day in your OPD, you are extremely irritable. Yes or no? And this irritability is aggravated by your extra cup of coffee, the caffeinated effect. So you need to know what you're doing. And like Dr. Amdekar was saying, we were taught everything by our grandparents. There was no evidence-based medicine. We, but today, for everything, we want evidence-based medicine. So look at this. If you slept well, you had no buildup of beta amyloid. So it's something like cleaning up the CNS, restoration of brain power. You have no beta amyloid buildup, so Alzheimer's is out. Your performance improves, your concentration improves, your cognition improves, your IQ improves, your mood improves. And there is a lot of linkage of psychiatric disorders and sleep. So today when you take a proper history, see one thing which we all neglect. This happened uh, two years back. And I was delivering a lecture on what would you prefer, food, sleep, or Wi-Fi. And this was for students in Cooper Hospital. And we uh, uh, distributed pamphlets. And the order that we got was, first was Wi-Fi, second was food, and some didn't have sleep. So it was shocking. And that's the way life is today. We have more preference for things that interest us. And it's this light pollution that is responsible for putting a full stop on sleep. Immunity. We all know that when we are sick, we tend to sleep. So immunity goes up if you sleep the right way. See the hormonal changes that you can get. You are stressed out. You have insulin resistance. You have ghrelin leptin alterations 
So naturally you're going to be pushed into metabolic syndrome. And you don't grow well because growth hormone comes in the night. So it is when you get into your non-REM sleep that you're going to get into the growth hormone phase. And that is the reason why when your tonsils are knocked out and you suddenly start sleeping and eating and doing well, getting less infections, you suddenly grow. It's not the infection. It is a growth hormone surge which has been put back in action. And this is the most important thing today. Because today nothing sells like two things. One is sex, the other is aging. So I'll talk about sex a bit later. Because just like you have snoring, you can have, uh, uh, that is cataphrenia. That's also a sleep disordered breathing. So I'll come to it about how you generate nitric oxide in your nostril, which is responsible for your sexual functions. So if I try to teach people that way, they may sleep better. Okay, so when I talk about telomere length, telomere length, if it shortens, you know you're aging fast. So one way to prolong life is sleep well. So you need to sleep over your problems. And the thing is different. So if you take a pediatric age group and an adult, what you usually see is an adult is very sleepy, he's very fatigued, his performance is not good, he's irritable. But in a child, they're usually hyperactive because they're trying to keep themselves awake. And I think Sandeep Kelkar would totally agree with me, so also Samir, that this is something that's happening. So when we have a hyperactive child, we take a sleep history. And how many of you all take sleep history? None. So that's what sir was trying to tell us in the morning. Yeah, a, a selected few, sorry. Uh, so sir was trying to tell us in the morning that his story, her story, tells you everything. But when you have parents who want to know, you require some evidence. And if the evidence does not show, you are in trouble. So you create more tests. So whenever you ask for a test, you ask only if it is needed or if it contributes. So here what you are seeing in the first one is being very sleepy. In the second one, you have a hyperactive child or a child who keeps distracting other children. And then secondary aneurysis, again you need to take a history. So three things that your receptionist can do is sleep, constipation, bedwetting. She can very well put ticks. Sota hai barobar, kabhi sota hai, kaisa sota hai. And how do you pick up a sleep disordered breathing? They go to sleep in one place, they are found in another place. The pillow is somewhere, the bed sheet is somewhere. Because everybody is sleeping at two. You can't ask the mother, what oh, ticks so raha tha kya? Everybody is sleeping. So if you find a baby in that sort of a thing, you know it's definitely a disturbed sleep. The second way is, you take the kid on the car and he dozes off. You know it's sleep disordered, breathing again there. So I, 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 I'm coming to the main case here. This is a seven-year-old girl who was referred to my clinic for anesthesia fitness, seen by a dentist and an ENT consultant in an orocentric OPD because today airway management is orocentric and they told her this that once we do something on you your appearance is going to change your posture is going to change you're going to grow well you're going to become more intelligent your IQ is going to go up and you're going to sleep well I said what the I, I just this is too much asking for too much but I'll tell you why that's going to be true. Normal delivery, but was top fed. Because today we know that if you are breastfed, the oral musculature, the palate, the sucking swallowing reflex, breathing, everything is going to happen in a normal way. Because when we evolve, today we have two types of medicine which are gaining importance. One is called evolutionary medicine and the other is called preventive medicine. We know acute medicine. Acute medicine is like a fracture. We know iatrogenic medicines. We are seeing plenty of it. Fine, so you have a new product into the market like an omalizumab, wonderful for an IgE problem. You give an omalizumab, you get anaphylaxis, poof, it all ends there because you presented such a rosy picture. So you need to counsel. So you have acute medicine, 
iatrogenic medicine, you have preventive medicine. Preventive is what I'm going to discuss, like vaccination, but here it is prevention of getting an OSA, and you have evolutionary medicine. Evolutionary medicine is there is a mismatch between the speed of our evolution and the exposure. So what basically uh, you need to know is, suddenly this brain started growing, and the facial configuration started changing, and the uvula went up, the epiglottis came down, and the brain had to take care of the airway. So you had a pliant oropharyngeal airway, which totally dependent on a highly specialized brain, but you evolved to speak. So from a snouty nose, you got a proper nose, little bit of flattening, the brain becoming big and having multiple functions. So speech, swallow, sleep, sucking, everything comes with that particular configuration. So in evolution, what we have seen is it was exclusive breastfeeding. Then we came down to bottle feeding. It was the crude stuff that we used to munch on. So our jaws were strong. The masseters were good. And we had a very good facial configuration, except for the nose part of it. And then also we shifted to the agricultural era and cooking. So everything was soft. So everything was getting soft. And then came the light. So sleep was disturbed. So there has been an end and mismatch between the way we have progressed in evolution. Evolution is not intelligent. Remember that. Evolution is Darwinian adaptation. Okay, engineering is intelligence. So know the difference. So if it is only adaptation, my brain has to be alert. My muscles have to be alert to keep my airway patent. And if I pick up a habit which causes maladaptation or dysfunctional muscular action, like a mouth breathing, I'm in for trouble. So this girl was a normal delivery, top fed, vaccinated. The mother said recurrent running nose. We didn't get into it. Noisy breathing, again, stutter, is it snoring? Poor diet, she was very picky about what she was eating and there was a smoker in the house. So when you look at a nose which is blocked, let's not get into the blocked nose, it could be irritation, the first eye, it could be infection, the second eye, it could be itch, the third, that is allergy, or it could be iatrogenic. Fine, or the last one is, which we all know is, the last eye, I don't know. Okay, so it could be one of this, but we are not going to get into what caused the blocked nose. And it's sensible. If you have a blocked nose, you have to breathe. So you breathe through your mouth. So this is also sensible. When you start breathing through your mouth, it is dry air. It's going to dry up. So you're going to feel thirsty. You're going to lose more fluids. Because of the air going in through the wrong pathway, everything is going to be pushed back. That also we agree. So I'm going to show you a lot of common sense. You don't require medical knowledge for it and what actually happens in the progression of this disorder. Now, if you look at her, what is very obvious? Open mouth. This looks quite hypotonic. She doesn't look very bright. And she has got these nasolabial folds, which are totally flattened. And you would call it adenoid faces. Fine? Done? OK. You peep into her throat, you find these big tonsils almost coming in the middle to kiss each other. She's pale. She's got dental crowding. Okay, you must have heard of enough number of people with impacted molar. So we'll come to that also. And she has got extremely poor oral hygiene. This is one thing we all miss out on. So when you have a child who comes to you with caries, you need to find out whether there is allergic rhinitis whether this child is mouth breathing. So when you mouth breathe, you dry up the mouth, you change the oral microbiota, you get in all the wrong things, and it's natural for your lymphoid tissue to proliferate. It may not be infection, it could be irritation. It could just be damage to the structures causing alarmins to be released. Okay, so there is so much more to medicine. And that's how the, the overlapping dentition looked inside. And like Dr. Amdekar always says, you need to understand before you jump into any treatment. 
And when you treat, you need to understand the perils of treatment because the treatment should not be worse than the disease. And everything is connected. I'll show you how. You agree to this, adenoid faces and all the features that are there. Ideal breathing is supposed to be not audible. So you don't, you don't do that except for a yogic fellow who teaches you. Because there are ways in which you manipulate your brain and your inner system. Otherwise, ideal breathing should not be audible. There should be no mouth breathing. The lips have to be closed. And you close your mouth and breathe through your nose. Where is your tongue sitting? It's resting on your heart palate. Now do one more thing. Place your tongue towards the heart palate like this. Close your nostril and try to breathe. You can't breathe. So the place of the tongue is on the heart palate, not on the floor of the mouth. Fine? Okay? And why do you breathe through your nose? Everybody, see, if you take most of the mammals, or let's take somewhere around about 5,400 mammals, majority or all of them are only mouth breathers. So you have conditioning, it's a big term, conditioning, humidification, filtration, nitric oxide. This is what I was talking about. You generate so much amount of nitric oxide that it is responsible, we all know, na, Viagra, via nitric oxide, the erectile function. Fine? So I could sell my sleep. Fine? So more oxygenation, less carbon dioxide wash out, and there is a better synergy when you have connectivity with your CNS and your nose. Because that's the way you are made because there is some amount of uh, interaction through the olfactory or the cribriform plate. So this child to begin with had a blocked nose, then had the adenotonsillar hypertrophy. And you need to understand that when you look at the maxilla, the maxilla forms the floor of the nose. The maxilla also forms the side, this thing of the eyes. So that is why when you get adenoid faces, this is pinched and this goes in. It's almost sunken eyes. So when you have this uh, cheeks pushing your maxilla inside and you have a tongue resting on your palate, that doesn't happen. So that is counteracted by the tongue. But if you have a tongue sitting on the floor of your mouth, what happens is this thing is pushed in. So the maxilla is constricted. So what should be a nice curve becomes V-shaped, a high arched palate, crowding of the dentition, and you may have all sort of impacted molars. So that's how the story starts. And maximum growth of the maxilla, the facio maxillary structures, 60% is in the first six years, 90 by 12. And it continues till 18. And you look, if, if you have the tongue sitting in that high position, which is the normal position, this does not occur. So what I'm trying to say is you have a genetic predisposition. But if you develop a habit that promotes the genetic predisposition, you're in for trouble. And today, what does the dentist do? They don't remove dentitions. They don't remove teeth. What they do is they expand. So the maxilla is distracted. The mandible is distracted. And also when this happens, what happens is your maxilla tends to go back, the mandible tends to go back. So when you go back, the real estate inside your mouth shrinks. So the tongue is bound to block the posterior pharyngeal wall. The soft palate is bound to block. And you have the palatopharyngeus, the palatoglosses, all that can be pushed. The pharyngeal walls can come in the middle. So it becomes very difficult. And why are we understanding this more and more? Because we do something called as drug-induced sleep endoscopy. We create artificial sleep with a mixture of ketamine and dexmedetomin, and then we pass in a scope to see where is the obstruction. So, and we do find that the tongue could be shifted back, the palate could be pushed back, but it's actually all the muscles working in cohesion. And see, you can see, now, nowadays a lot of CT is being done because we have Alara techniques, which is very low radiation, as much as just a plain X-ray skull. 
So we have cone beam and the ordinary CT that are being used in sleep medicine. And this is the uh, hypothesis that has now come in. A nose block of any etiology which makes you mouth breathe, how it leads to a systemic inflammatory reaction with postural maladaptation and an abnormal orofacial growth. So this was the story and this is what happens. And we all know about a blocked nose and a long face syndrome. So I'll just go a bit fast here. And this is the compensated airway. So when you have an airway which is compromised, you tend to do this. When you tend to do this, these extensors are shortened. This is stretched. So in most of the early part of OSA, when you have an obstructive hypoventilation, there is carbon dioxide buildup plus this sort of a posture. So for every inch you go in front, the amount that the spine has to take is 8% more of body weight. So naturally you get up with a headache. You have neck ache. It's not a tension headache. And you need to understand this. So they were right in two things. The appearance. Yes, the posture, because this is going to continue. You have kyphosis lower down and you're going to be like this. So you are going to change appearance, you are going to change posture, you are going to improve sleep. And these are basics, I'm just going to run through this. Yeah. So when you have a compromised airway, you look at the bony structure and the soft tissue structure. So today in pediatrics we have two phenotypes. One is called the adenotonsillar phenotype, which is very common between 3 and 6. That is a time they grow. And the second one is the obese phenotype, which is usually seen in adolescents, but now we have an overlap. We see it in all age groups. Fine. So when you look at this compromised airway, this is famous. Craniofacial aberrations, I'm not going to take over syndromes. This is something very important. It is not just tone, it is endurance. That means the type of muscle fibers, type 1, aerobic, anaerobic. So tone, endurance, coordination. And this is what I was trying to touch on that for every case of a suspected OSA wherein you are going to do an adenotonsillectomy or you are going to put that baby on CPAP or any form of therapy, you need to do as an adjunct oropharyngeal muscular training. You need to train the tongue, you need to train the palate. Very simple. You need to involve a speech therapist. The palate and the tongue. Fine. And you need to stress on this. And this is something that we all do know that when you have a blocked nose and that is a negative pressure being exerted by our lower airway, the pharynx is the only pliable component which is going to collapse. And if the pharynx already has enough fat on its sides and a hypotonic muscle, this is going to happen even faster. And see the number of muscles that you have. So you have a tensor palatini bringing up the palate. You have a number of muscles attached to the hyoid that keep it open. That's why a low disposition of the hyoid, by exercise you could get it up a little bit. And I'm not just talking, I have enough references. Since I'm running through my slides, I've just kept the references. If anybody wants, I'll send it across to them, including the oropharyngeal exercises. That could be prescribed. And all of us could be doing it. And the most important muscle is the genioglossus. Five connections from the brain. You have a chemoreceptor, a mechanoreceptor, and three big more neurons controlling the genioglossus. You can have aberrant genioglossus, but in a normal individual, the genioglossus plays a very important role in keeping the airway open. So non-REM, it keeps it open. It's only during REM when you are paralyzed that the genioglossus function goes down to a significant effect but even there, the chemo and mechanoreceptors will activate the genioglossus. So there was so much of promise to the genioglossus that they created a pacemaker. So they created a pacemaker that was connected to the genioglossus. As soon as the airway collapsed, there would be a signal which would keep the airway open. But now we know it is not just the genioglossus. 
So it is not just Ramesh out here. You need a Suhas, you need a Parmanand, you need a Bhavesh, you need so many people for anything to be successful. So that is why the oropharyngeal muscle maladaptation has to be rectified with exercise. And this is the domino effect. So it starts with mouth breathing, snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, wherein you don't have any gas exchange abnormalities, and obstructive hypoventilation ending up with an obstructive sleep apnea. I'm not going to do sleep studies, it'll make you sleep, but what I was trying to tell you is endurance, tone, coordination, space, just don't look at the tongue. You need, it's like fetopelvic disproportion. Same way, if the tongue can't fit into your oral cavity due to any cause, a big tongue, a small cavity or a tongue tie all have to be addressed. How many of you all look at tongue ties? Very, very important. It's something that's so important, it affects mobility and it affects a lot of function. And if you have a tongue tie, be it anterior, posterior, you need a measurement with a cotylose tape, it's not going to come up. It's going to push everything behind. So these are the oral clues that I'm going to give in the next five minutes, if it's okay. So all your questions can be during lunch, because I need to show you this. First is the Malampati scale, all of us know, those who intubate, that if the palate is very close to the tongue, the posterior part of the tongue, you know it's going to be a difficult intubation. Then a scallop tongue, what is a scallop tongue? There is a disparity between the oral cavity and the size of the tongue. So it's being pressed from all sides, so you get an imprint. So this child gets up in the morning with a painful tongue and a painful throat, ends up with a GP who gives a antibiotic. This is not odinophagia because of an infection, it's a dry mouth. Then look at the arches. If you have a narrow maxillary arch with a high palate, and crowding of teeth, you know for sure there is a problem going on. And naturally, if everything starts going back, there is going to be malocclusion. And you have grades in tongue scalloping, and now I'll show you. So the one on this side is scalloping. So the tongue size is okay, and on this side, it's a big tongue. Why you need to know this is because now you have adipose tissue also sitting on the tongue. Okay, and there are a lot of surgeons who go for tongue reduction, which should not be done. Again, there are, there are syndromes like Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, where you have macroglossia, where you may have to. We all know that as the tonsils start kissing each other, the obstructive elements increase. So D and E is definitely bad, and that's what is depicted in this photograph. But before you venture into this, you need to do a sleep study, get a cardiac evaluation that there is no right-sided abnormalities. You may even have to uh, give this patient uh, oral oropharyngeal exercises for a short duration before you take them up for surgery in a tertiary center. You can have a big uvula like this blocking. The obvious ones are very easily picked up. But what the patient usually does is, he has compensatory mechanisms. He can lift the floor of the mouth to get rid of the tongue tie effects. He can strain his neck. So you have to put your finger beneath the tongue, fix the floor and then ask him to lift his tongue when you take measurements. And also how tense the tongue is. If you have somebody with a gummy smile, periodontal disease pretty common. Again, take a sleep history. This, you definitely need to take a sleep history. Bruxism. There are so many mothers who come and tell you. Kidae. Na? Yeah. So, bruxism is a way of keeping your airway open. It's actually a tongue reflex acting on the jaw reflex. So, when you start doing it and your dentition is affected, that you have fractures and the lower portion are eroded, it's time for you to wake up. This is the same Malampati scale. And here I wanted you to think. There are so many kids who are more comfortable in the lateral position. They can't sleep in their supine position. Because Andarka real estate is narrow. So there is a disparity between the tongue and the oropharynx. Or the palate and the oropharynx. Or the tone. Or the endurance. Or the coordination. 
trained opera singers no essay singing methods what i have put on the top is the nagaswaram in all our south indian weddings we have this even in the temple so when you play these these individuals you don't get it because they are oropharyngeal musculature is well so well trained and the so called didgeridoo is the australian equivalent of a nagaswaram so cranial cranio facial traits can be altered in early childhood our habits aggravate our predisposition i only took two things from the big puzzle of obstructive sleep apnea that was the mouth breathing and tongue and she's really doing well and she's on oro myofunctional therapy because 40% of individuals who undergo adenotonsillectomy can have a relief a relapse of osa even though everything has been cleared because of maladapted muscle function so this is something that you need to read you can get into the youtube uh, uh, dr javadekar's brother dr javadekar who's the dental surgeon at dy patil he has a lot of videos they're excellent ones and i hope i didn't put you off to sleep thank you so much for a patient here thank you sir uh any questions for sir or you can we can yeah, take I it think later so. we'll take it later thank you sir for the wonderful talk thank you it was quite interesting and we got a few interesting take home messages of taking a good sleep history and oral examination for every patient uh thank you sir i think you just have to educate your parents and kids about sleep hygiene and that's it okay you can have a sleep questionnaire which is there in our nelson okay multiple epworth and there are so bears so you can go through any of those questionnaires but certain things are pretty obvious and don't wait for them to become obvious tongue tie don't neglect mouth breathing don't neglect thank you sir for sensitizing us again to such a sensitive and important uh, topic in our daily routine as a token of appreciation i would uh, request dr uh, amrita to please hand over a small memento to dr shridhar ganpati sir I request Dr. Vaishnavi to give a small memento to Dr. Amruta and Dr. Pooja.